Welcome to the Business Vitality Podcast. My name is Katherine Canty. I am the host and an executive coach. I work with teams, individuals, and leaders to help create a measured leadership change. We do that using practical applications, and our clients are creating 100% measured results as seen by those around them. Not necessarily what I think or what they think, but what the other people are seeing. And they are being recognized for the hard work that they're doing. If you're interested in learning more about some of the work that we're doing, you can learn more at KatherineCanty.com. I would love for you to subscribe to this show, to Business Vitality. This is my way to continue to pay it forward and share business best practices. Stay tuned and listen to the interview. Thanks for being here. Herb Acaliano, you are the founder and CEO of Aspire Growth Advisors, found on the web at AspireGrowthAdvisors.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Catherine, it is a pleasure to be here and also to be with the Business Vitality podcast listeners. A pleasure and thank you for having me on. I think this is going to be fun. You bring a really unique uh, background and also a business mind. And um, I'm looking forward to kind of diving into this. I enjoyed our our pre-conversation. And um, first, I just want to hear what does Growth Advisors do? Do you mind explaining that to us? Sure. So, I work with mid-market CEOs and their leadership team to help drive, scale their business, reduce the drama in running a business, and ultimately unleashing the potential of the people and the company opportunity that they have. And many of us leaders in business teams have this vision of what we want to become but it's locked up in our head somewhere. And what I try and do is help the leadership team get it out of their head into a simple, scalable, executable, one-page plan, and then help them with the rest of the company bring that wonderful vision to reality. And that's a beautiful journey that we take with these leaders. And it's truly why I was born and the reason why I do what I do is helping leadership scale the complexity and achieve the vision that they want. What makes you different, Herb, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, what I've, what I've researched before is you're not just teaching it to teach it. You have, you've done it and you've done this work yourself with your own business by being the president and um, leading an organization being in that organization for over three decades. Do you mind explaining your background? And because it feels like that background experience is really what drove you into, it sounds like this next phase of, of being able to help more people. Um, I grew up the son of a entrepreneur. We ran a family business um, that was in the technology staffing arena. We also ran an education business. And as a result of being brought up by an entrepreneurial father and mother, I learned some of the challenges of being in family business, number one. And then number two, the challenges over 35 years in my business career, navigating the different stages of growth. It's different to run a $5 million company than it is to run a 20 million versus a hundred million. And yet I saw so many companies around me that stayed a $5 million company for 10 years and could never break through, or they had one good year, maybe two, but they couldn't put three, four, five good years of growth in a row. That consistency of doing it. Um, Some of them, had companies they began in the beginning, they loved because they wanted to do a certain work, but the more employees they had, the more products they provided, the more locations they opened, the more customers they served, it became complex, drama increased. And what became initially a love story turned into a nightmare for these owners that were running their business. And Ultimately, we want to help them fall back in love with the business they created. And I'm a big fan of saying, I want you to run your business. 
I don't want your business to run you. And there's a big difference. And so our business was at a point where we were kind of stuck. We'd been at a level for a while. Other family members, generations were changing over. And I looked around the company and we found that if we wanted to keep these A players we had, we needed to have bigger futures for all of us. Because A players will not stay with you if your company stay uh, stagnant or not growing. And that's really the impetus that got me into understanding the methods of scaling up a company. And by growing bigger opportunities, more people could thrive and would keep great people longer and have more fun doing it. I think that's a great observation. The fact that your A players have got to have a game and we have to support them with that game. And sometimes I think there's just as much responsibility on the A player to come back with a plan of what it is that they want to see. And I'm, I'm seeing that in my executive coaching, these, these sponsors hire me, they got these high potential folks and they're like, we'll cheer them on to do anything. And the, the junior person is coming in and saying, well, just tell me what to do. And we really have to change the way they're thinking because sometimes the CEO doesn't always have the answers. Well, at least based off of some of the entrepreneurial experiences that I've had, and I've got a few close to home, you know, we don't always have the answer and we got to live in that gray. And I love that you're taking the complex and, and making it simple. There's, there's good stuff there, but you said something that really intrigued me, which is the drama. And we see drama in big corporate. We see drama also in the family run businesses, and it makes me think about the family dynamics of a family member coming back into the business after being raised in the business and then spends, you know, 20 years working for dad. And you can't help but have these, these conversations and this, um, this atmosphere. It's really hard to explain. And I don't know, do you have any insights? Because I, I have a few people that I work with they're in a family business and it, it's going great. And you've got, it's just a different dynamic. I don't know if it's necessary. It's yeah. not drama, but it's just different. Do you mind talking about that? Maybe do you have a couple of best practices that just come to mind based off of your experience? Yeah. So I, um, I lived in that for 33 years and I wouldn't trade a minute of it. When I think of the journey itself, being able to work with my parents and siblings when I was older, I so much appreciated more the time I had with my mom and dad who have since passed. But the time I had with them as a mature adult was truly a gift. So that is one of the biggest things I had was that time. But a couple of things I see. Number one, it's okay to have family values in running your company. But the difference is you need to have professional practices in operating. And that's where the confusion comes in. Some family members don't understand that we can have family values, but it's going to take professional practices like being accountable for certain roles, treating everybody the same, not having the family plan, and then everybody else plan, because A players pick up on that. And they don't mind treating good people well, but treating family members well who are not performing well sends a wrong message. And it's a delicate topic. Um, and I think it takes a leadership team that has the finesse to deal with some of the family history in the past and not let that hamper the family future that you want to create. Not easy, but doable if your leadership team is committed to make it family values orientated, but professionally run as the goal. I think that's great advice. Thank you for, for taking a moment and sharing that. You also mentioned, of you know, as we grow, which is just normal in business, people grow, things get very complex. And you mentioned being able to talk about taking the complexity and really bringing it down. And I love that you have a great idea, which is put it down into one 
one page. Like, let's bring it all down into one page. Does that tie into the work that you're doing now in regards to scaling up and the framework associated with that? Or is that how you ran the business when you were CEO and it just transitioned into this? Do you mind talking about that? Yeah. Um, so somebody back in early 2003 gave me a copy of this book, Scaling Up. How a few companies make it and why the rest don't. And there's about 30 million companies in the US today. Do you realize that less than one half of 1% ever make it to 10 million in revenue or more per year? Mm. Now, you, I mean, most people don't think 10 million is a large company, but one half of 1%. 4% only make it to a million or more. So scaling up, you can talk all you want that you're going to grow, grow, grow. It is not easy, but if you have the right framework and experience to navigate it, completely possible. And that's kind of the journey we went on. There's four decisions you need to get right around people, around your strategy, around the way you execute, and the way you manage your cash. And as you're going through this journey, you're going to stumble upon a couple of big barriers to doing it. Number one is, I'm a leader, small company looking to grow, but I'm really good at leading day to day. I love what I do. I know a lot of what we need to do, but the business is growing. And my first barrier is I don't have good leadership succession planning in place. Everyone I need to tell what to do, but I haven't developed the next people who can manage more people with me. And I get stuck and I get frustrated having to make all the decisions all day long. You feel like you're drinking from a fire hose when you get in the office. If, if you've ever had that feeling, it's not good. The second thing is scalable infrastructure. As you're adding more employees, more products, more client types, more locations, how do you manage the org structure of decision-making and communication between all these different constituents? That complexity creates drama and doesn't allow customers and employees to be happy and you stall. The third one, is marketing and market dynamics. You go off with a bang, your business is booming. Couple of years, next thing you know, competitors are entering. There are different product offerings. You're getting commoditized. Your margins are dropping and your employees want more and more money and all your overhead keeps going up and you're feeling squeezed or like you're drowning in quicksand. Those three things need to be navigated and by making better decisions with people, strategy, execution, and cash. And we have simple tools that we use once we diagnose where the issue is, and we have them simple so that your team can implement and make the fix that you need to make. And so this is the kind of journey of diagnosing what the challenge is and then utilizing the right tool to navigate through it. And I've been using it for 20 years, like anything, you can read a good book, but what are the few books you've mastered that are gonna make the biggest difference in your business? And this was one of the books that did, did it for me. That's fantastic. You know, how many times have we all read a book, but we didn't execute? And you've, you've used the word execution. You've used the word accountability. I'm sure there's a level of accountability with the work that you're doing. That's again, so important. And you spoke about that even in, in the, um, um, in the family type businesses, creating that accountability, um, Accountability sounds vital, and, and I keep hearing it bubble um, between that and execution. Do you have maybe one or two examples of just how you're living it or how how you're able to lead and create that? Yeah, um, I think a couple of big picture anecdotes, um, anecdotes I would share. Number one, 
I think accountability starts with self-leadership. We talk about people leading others, but I, lead, I believe every employee has the opportunity to be a great self-leader. What does that mean? I take pride in what my role is. I understand the accountabilities that go with it. <clears throat> and I understand the metrics that measure that I'm achieving the accountabilities. And I'm not doing it, Catherine, because my boss told me to. I'm doing it because I am self-managing myself and take pride in achieving personal success, which happens to align to the overall company success and contribute and have impact. I think that's the first part of the mindset you need to hire and develop. The second part is, does the leadership team understand what the most important priorities are for the company this quarter? Like, what's the main thing? There's a lot of shiny objects. Finance has a big project. They think that's pretty important. Sales has a new product launch. That's pretty cool. That's pretty important. Uh, Marketing is developing and rolling out a new website. But if our cash, if we're bleeding and losing money, or we've had 10% of our customers turn over, what is the main thing? And are we all clear about priorities that will align to solving that and then putting everything else second, third, fourth behind it? So it's coming together, looking at what the ultimate goal is for the year in every quarter, developing that sprint action plan to deal with the first things first. And then your department, how do they best contribute to it? So that you have synergy, you have an alignment, and you have an impact in the area your company needs to have. I like that you talked about prioritization that's come up lately in some conversations that I've, that I've been having with clients. And, you know, prioritization is different at every level. It's different at, at, you know, where we used to be. And, and Marshall Goldsmith is one of my, my mentors. And um, yes. he wrote a book called What Got You Here Will Not Get You There. And I feel like I quote that all the time to a lot of the folks I work with because we got to change the way they think. And they really have to change the way they're prioritizing their work. And as you begin to, like what you just said, your accountability begins with self-leadership. And so many of us just want to dive into whatever it is. And really none of this stuff starts without us. And as it starts with us, we have to begin to prioritize like what you're mentioning and what you're talking about. Do you have, I think a lot of people struggle with prioritization and what really needs to be done in relation to the overall health of the company and the organization or the team that we're on. Do you have any tips or tricks in regards to prioritization um, that you have found to be helpful, especially as a, as someone who's been in a CEO position for decades? Um, how, how do you, because you've got more work than anybody else, but yet you've got to prioritize. So do you mind talking about that? Yeah. Um, first thing is what are the targets for the quarter or for the year? You may have a sales target of 10 million for the year. You may have a gross margin target of 6 million. You may have an overhead target of 4 million and leave you with a profit target of 2 million. You can have other operational targets like NPS score or maybe employee turnover, things like that. But I look at these targets either for the year or for the quarter with the client. And we ask ourselves, where do we see the bottleneck? Is it going to be getting the 10 million? Is it going to be getting the 6 million in margin because cost of goods has gone up or pricing pressure is really pinching us? Or is it really in the overhead because storage costs, uh, employment costs, benefits costs are driven up? And we look at the targets thoughtfully and we say, if margin is the bottleneck, how do we prioritize that? So the purchasing manager says, well, I would have a priority to lower cost of goods by 5%. 
operations manager is going to say, I'm going to work on staff utilization and I'm going to get the utilization up from 65 to 70%. Sales team is saying, well, if I could work on pricing and increase pricing by 2%, the pricing, the cost of goods, the staff utilization is going to do what to the gross margin? And drive it up. And because we're now clear, raising the gross margin by five points over the year is the ultimate priority. We know the pieces that we control that will most greatly contribute to that result. And then we leave and go off for the quarter and we start executing on delivering that working together to overcome roadblocks, and then celebrating and recognizing accomplishment at the end of that period, which I think is one of the funnest parts of our job at the end of the day we get to do. I love that you just took something simple, but yet it, it gets turned into complex thinking. You, you took you took this example, this story, and you applied prioritization to it. And so many people get caught in the weeds and they really need to just elevate up from the weeds and simplify like what you're talking about. You really create a clear message of like what each team can do to contribute to that prioritization of that, that topic. And it sounds like, you know, you're living it. You're, you, I love how you articulate it because you're taking stuff that sometimes when we're in it, it gets really complicated and we're just overwhelmed and can easily get overwhelmed. And I love the simplicity that you bring back to this and you are truly able to get that down into a one-page document of exactly what everybody's going to go do. And it sounds like it's it's a result of the framework from scaling up that you've lived and now you're implementing. Um, do you mind talking about some of the customers that you're helping now um, with the business and what kind of clients you're serving and what kind of clients yeah. you're, you're looking for? So... Um... My practice is not, it's, it's really agnostic. I'm not focused on any one industry. I have companies that are in the products space. I have professional service firms. I have an engineering firm. I have a company that does children's uh, classroom design and furnishing. Uh, I have another client that does slush mas machines in South Africa. I have a, a company that does uh, building power in Romania, uh, some great companies in the Philippines and a bunch in the US. But the one thing that they all want is they want to scale their business to greater heights. The mindset is a growth mindset, owner and leadership team that minimally wants to double their business in the next three to five years. So they have an appetite for growth and they have the urgency. They want to do it now. They don't want to wait 10 years. The third thing they have is this constant thirst for development and educating not only themselves, but their team and people around them. Can you imagine if you have a great market, you launch a product, your company goes from one to 50 million in 24 months. Your company is just shot up like this. But what if the people in it don't develop enough with it to handle running a $50 million company versus a 1 million? Mm -hmm. You'd have to have a whole different mindset about the org structure, the actual capabilities of the team, the market knowledge of where you served would be much broader. And yet, so we're trying to balance in growing the company, it's also connected to developing the team with it. And the more you have in balance on either way, the more drama and the less chance of you repeating it year after year after year. And these are the things that I've found during this, you know, 30 year journey of working on my own companies and supporting others. This is fantastic. Herb, if people want to learn more, they're just curious about, you know, I like what he's saying. Where do you go from here? Um, what's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, so quite simply, you can go to Aspire, 
growthadvisors with an S.com. You can look up Herb Pogliano on LinkedIn. But Aspire Growth Advisors is a great way. Send me a message, love to connect. Uh, and if I can help others along the journey, um, I'm sure you, you've had this, Catherine, but nobody gets to the success they get to without standing on the shoulders of other giants before them. My mother and father were amazing business leaders and mentors. I had my own business coach for years. And unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. And when he did, that's when I knew when we exited that that would be the next step in my career, helping others do what he did for me. I love your story, your journey. I love how you're continuing to pay it forward. And um, sounds like you're a lifelong learner. So I love being able to, to talk with lifelong learners. Herb Cagliano, you are the founder and CEO of Aspire Growth Advisors, found on the web at aspiregrowthadvisors.com. Thank you so much for joining us. It has been my pleasure. I wish you and your audience much continued success and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. If you like it, please subscribe, share this episode or this show with other people around you. The greatest form of a compliment is a referral. I really appreciate them. And if you think that you want to learn more about some of the work we're doing, I encourage you to reach out to katherinecanty.com. You can schedule a call or just continue to read articles and information that we post out there. Thank you so much for being here.